heavenly sunlight. <clears throat> Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep vale. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light, in him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to his side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, Pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Please be seated. Before we're led in prayer, let's sing Mansion Over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander. But walk the streets that are purest gold. Though often tempted, tormented and tested, and like a prophet, my pillow a stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where We'll never grow old. And someday yonder, we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are purest gold. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a robe and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday under we will never more wander, but walk the streets that 
our purest gold. Let us pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us and the opportunity to be together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray, Father, that the worship that we have here this morning, the songs be lifted up, that they all be for you. Father, we thank you for our visitors and our extended family. We pray, Father, that those that are traveling, that you'll be with them and protect them and keep them safe. Father, we thank you for the teachers. We thank you for the elders, the deacons, and the members here locally. Father, we pray that you will strengthen us and continue to help us to do and understand your will, be guided by it, and to help draw others to you. Father, we're thankful to have Dale and his wife Paula here this morning. We pray, Father, that you give him the recollection that he needs to, to deliver the lesson from your word. Helping us to understand, we pray that our hearts will be pricked, that we can know and understand your word. Father, we thank you so much for the sacrifice and your, your son, Jesus Christ, because it is because of him that has helped prepare us the mansion in the hilltop that we want. Father, we love you. We thank you. And especially in your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray all of this. Amen. Look forward to Dale Babinski's lesson this morning. We'll sing one song before uh, the lesson. Do you have scripture? Okay. Let's stand and sing, He Bore It All. Hard to be sitting down on this song. Let's sing with a mighty voice. <clears throat> My precious Savior suffered pain and agony, he bore it all that I might live. He broke the bonds of sin and set the captive free, he bore it all that I might live. He bore it all that I might see his shining face, he bore it all that I might live. I stood condemned to die, but Jesus took my place. He bore it all that I might live. They placed a crown of thorns upon my Savior's head. He bore it all. By cruel man with spear, his side was pierced and blood. He bore it all that I might live. He bore it all that I might see his shining face. He bore it all that I might live. I stood condemned to die, but Jesus took my place. He bore it all that I might live. Up Calvary's hill in shame, the blessed Savior trod. He bore it all that I might live. Between two thieves they crucified the Son of God. He bore it all that I might live. He bore it all that I might see his shining face. He bore it all that I might live. I stood condemned to die, but Jesus took my place. He bore it all that I might live. Amen. Please be seated. Very familiar passage today from the 16th chapter of Matthew beginning at verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, 
He was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, uh, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. As probably most of you know, we've been in search for a pulpit minister, full-time pulpit minister, and it seems like it's gone on for a while, but we're getting it narrowed down pretty good. So we're blessed today by having uh, Dale Babinski here with us this morning, his wife Paula. Uh, they have a daughter, uh, Isabella. Um, Dale currently um, is the Dean of Students at Southeast Institute of Bible Studies in Knoxville, Tennessee. He preaches at Carnes Church on occasion as well. He's also a teacher there and teaches um, denominational doctrines, um, uh, life of Moses, ministry technology, Judges, Ruth, Hebrews, education, research and grammar, and life of David and Timothy. <laughs> he's also um, he's also got a BA in theology. He's got an MA in history, specialized in Russian history, right? <laughs> so he's well versed in a lot of things. He has an AA in pre professional law, has a BA in historical political science. Another side note about Dale, he's a car guy too. I got to see one of his sermons, and during that sermon, he was talking about the, uh, uh, oh shoot, the name of the car. Yeah, Austin Martin, Austin Martin. He was talking about restoring something. And he, you see the Austin Martin, beautiful collar, but and then he said, well, you can't take an, make an Austin Martin, and he shows a Pinto, a Ford Pinto. So that kind of stuck in my mind. So, yeah, you definitely can't make an Austin Martin out of a Pinto. But today, uh, this weekend, you know, with, even if you're not a, a car guy or a car girl, if you're on the parkway, you're going to get a chance to sit there and watch all kinds of them up and down the strip because the strip is slow. So, but it's wonderful to have Dale here this morning with us. And uh, uh, we, again, we have fellowship dinner afterwards. So we, everyone is invited to get to know Dale and Paula and spend a little bit more time. And we have one next week too, so maybe we also take muscos or leftovers, right? <laughs> so, Dale. Good morning. Well, that's a little loud. <laughs> I'm pl pleased to be here. It's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here with you all at Great Smoky Mountains Church of Christ here in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and uh, blessed uh, for the opportunity uh, to be here and, and excited about uh, the possibility of, uh, of us laboring together in the Lord's kingdom and uh, just uh, really thankful uh, for this opportunity of uh, I've been uh, a lot of different places. I was raised in Ohio and uh, went, went to Colorado for preacher training and preached in Carolina and, and here in Tennessee. And we just, we love it here. We love it in the mountains. And um, we're uh, just thankful for this, this opportunity that, that you provided. Been praying for you all. Been praying that uh, you find a person that's going to be the best fit for you all uh, in all of this and, and be able to march forward and continue to grow and strengthen in number. Who is Jesus? When we think about Jesus and, and who he is, um, maybe sometimes people in the world have a lot of different ideas. And you know, our world is a changing place. It's, it's a lot different than it used to be. Uh, in our world, people used to understand that, that there was a God and that Jesus was his son and that the Bible uh, is the word of God. But more and more often now, people are listing none of the above 
with regards to their religious preferences uh, in surveys that are done. As a matter of fact, in Pigeon Forge, uh, the statistics show from 2010 that a little over 48% of those that were surveyed listed none of the above as their religious affiliation. And so while we used to maybe be able to go out and tell people about the plan of salvation because they already believed the Bible was the Word of God, it seems now that we've got to back up a step or two. We're going to have to be able to prove to them that there's a God, that the, the Bible is the Word of God, and who it is that Jesus is. Because if we get in discussions with folks, and hopefully when we discuss things with, with people that are in our world, that are in our sphere of influence, whether they're neighbors or, or friends or family, those that are non-Christians, hopefully at some point we get around to talking to them about Jesus. And if you were to ask them, well, well, who is Jesus? Who do you think Jesus is? They might have a lot of different answers. If you ask different people, you might get a lot of different answers. They might say, oh, Jesus, he was, he was such a good guy, and uh, you know, he was a really good man. Uh, he had some good philosophy on life. I, I love Jesus. I love Jesus' style. I love how, you know, Jesus was all about love. He never condemned anybody. People maybe have a lot of different ideas about who Jesus is. You know, Jesus was interested in what people thought about who he is. That's the question that was asked here that, that Brother Hayes read for us this morning in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus and his disciples are approaching this region of Caesarea Philippi and he asks them saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Right? He wants to know what, what do the people think? What's the pulse of the, the nation, if you will, as to what it is that they think about Jesus and do they understand who he is and, and what it is that he's about? And they answer him, they say, well, some say John the Baptist, that they thought that maybe John the Baptist had been reincarnated somehow or had come back from the dead. And that's one of the things that Herod thought when, when he hears about what Jesus is preaching. And so they say, some say John the Baptist or, or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And this gives them an idea of what the common folk think, uh, if you will, about who Jesus is. But then he asks his disciples, he says, but who do you say? that I am, right? These are the guys that have been with him. They've been traveling with him. They've, they've seen what it is that he can do. And they're going to have a maybe clearer thought as far as who he is. And, and Peter, you know, answers right away. Now, a lot of times Peter answers right away and he puts his foot in his mouth. But on this occasion, Peter answers right away and he gets the right answer. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, well, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Now, how did Peter know that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. How had God manifested that so that Peter knew what the answer was? Well, Peter knew the answer in part because he had spent time with Jesus and had been able to see the things that Jesus could do and that Jesus could do things that men cannot do. That he can't be just a, a good man, that he can't be just a man, that he has to be the Son of God he has to be the Messiah because of the things that he can do. And if you turn back with me in your Bibles, if you were in Matthew 16, turn back eight chapters, come to Matthew chapter 8, because we're going to camp out in Matthew chapter 8 this morning in the time that we have. And I want us to look at five specific miracles that Jesus performs here in Matthew chapter 8 that show us that he's not just a man because he can do things that men cannot do. The first of these miracles begins in verse 1. It says, When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand, touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And so the first miracle that we see here has to do with this leper. Now he's come down from the mountain. He's just finished uh, the Sermon on the Mountain. So he comes down from the mountain and this leper approaches him. Now the leper understands something about Jesus because he's going to ask Jesus to cleanse him of his leprosy. Now you wouldn't just ask anybody to cleanse you of leprosy because leprosy was a terrible disease. Uh, basically what would happen is that parts of your skin would just kind of fall off and you would be left exposed uh, to the elements. You'd be left exposed to dirt and everything else. You didn't have any feelings, so you couldn't tell if you had cut or injured yourself. And so leprosy was a terrible disease. And in order, because they, they, they would lose their skin, they would, they would take strips of cloth and they would wrap that affected area to try to provide some sort of covering for themselves to protect themselves. But, you know, in the first century, they don't have any way of sterilizing cloth in order to, to do that. And so they still had problems with infection and they would still have problems with that leprosy. And it was very contagious. 
You couldn't be around anybody else if you had leprosy. Uh, in Leviticus chapters 13 and 14 in the Mosaic Law, there was a prescription given there for what you had to do. And a lot of times, if you were a leper, you had to live uh, outside. You had to move away from the rest of uh, the settlement, right? And you had to be out there maybe in a leper colony uh, by yourself. You couldn't hug and kiss your wife. You couldn't bounce your grandchildren on your knee. You couldn't have a normal kind of life or normal relationships with people. And if you were passing by someone on the road, you had to cross over to the other side. You had to cover over your mustache and yell out unclean so that nobody would come near you, right? Because you were so contagious. And so someone that's living a life like that, there's no cure for leprosy. But yet this leper understands something about Jesus because he comes to him and he understands that he's got authority and that he's got power and he's got the ability to be able to heal him because he says, if you are willing, you can cleanse me. He believes that Jesus can do something about his leprosy. And notice in the text, it says that Jesus reached out and touched him and cured his leprosy. Now, did Jesus have to touch him in order to cure him? I think we see the compassion of our Lord here. That here's a man that nobody in their right mind would reach out and touch, right? And he reaches out and he touches him and he shows compassion on this man. And Jesus isn't worried about catching leprosy. He's not worried about becoming unclean. Now, just imagine for a moment that you're, you're out and you're working in your yard and you're maybe tending your garden or you're, you're cleaning out the chicken coop. We used, to, we used to have chickens and my wife would have to go out there and clean the chicken coop occasionally. Or maybe you're, you're you know, cleaning out and shoveling out the stables because you had a horse barn or something like that. And you've got a bunch of stuff on one of your hands and your other hand is clean, right? What happens when you put your hands together? Your clean hand isn't clean anymore, is it? But notice in this that Jesus, who is the clean, touches the leper who's the unclean. And not only does the unclean, not only does the clean not become unclean, but that which is unclean is cleansed. That's not natural. It's not what you would expect to happen. That's what makes it a miracle. And Jesus is able to cleanse this leper of his leprosy. And it, it's immediate, right, that he's cleansed of his leprosy. It, he doesn't have to wait, right? There's no doubt as to why this is the case, that his leprosy has left him. And Jesus tells him, well, don't say anything to anybody, right? Don't go declaring yourself to be clean. Why? Because under the Mosaic law, you had to go and present yourself to the priest. And you had to offer the gift that Moses commanded, and then the priest would pronounce you clean if your skin disease uh, had healed somehow. And so he tells him, you keep following the Mosaic law. You do what the law says. You go and, and see the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded. And so in this first miracle, we see that Jesus has got power and he's got authority over the exterior world, if you will, right? The exterior body of that leper. He could see that he had leprosy and he's able to cure him. And that's something that men simply can't do. The second miracle begins in verse 5. It says, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. So here's a centurion, he's a Roman, and not just a, any Roman, but he's a Roman leader. A centurion would be over a hundred fighting men. And so he's a guy that's used to being in charge. And the Romans are in charge of Palestine at this time. The Jews do not have uh, self-government. Now, they've got their own governor, but he's, he's appointed by Rome, and he's basically a puppet of Rome. The Roman Empire, make no, no bones about it, is in control of Palestine at this time. And they and the Jews don't get along with one another very well. The Jews were, to them, revolting. Uh, maybe not just in appearance, but also that they were always rebelling against Roman rule. They didn't like the Romans there. And so there's animosity between the Romans and the Jews. And they might look at it in a way and say, well, that Jew's not, he's not worthy to be under my roof. But notice the centurion turns that around. He tells Jesus, right, the Jewish carpenter, the, the preacher here, he says, I'm not willing or I'm not worthy, he says, for you to come under my roof. He understands something about Jesus. He understands that Jesus doesn't have to go to where the centurion lives in order to be able to heal his servant, that he can do it from where it is uh, that he is. So, so he says, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. All you need to do is speak the words and my servant will be healed. And notice, why does the centurion know this? 
He says in verse 9, For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. The centurion was a man who understood authority because he wields authority. And he's got men that are under him. And when he tells his men, I want you to go over here and do something, he knows that they're going to go and do it just because he told them to. And when he tells somebody to come here, he knows that they're going to come. It's not like when you call the cat, right? The cat doesn't come to you when you call him. The centurion knows that when he orders his men that, that they're going to come to him, right? And he doesn't have to watch over them. He doesn't have to look over their shoulder. doesn't have to send somebody behind them to make sure that they're doing what he said to do because he wields authority. And so he understands authority and he sees in Jesus that Jesus has the authority to be able to heal his servant and not only heal him, but heal him from wherever he is. We have no idea how far the centurion's home is from where this this interaction takes place. So he says, I understand authority. Now in verse 10 it says, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, assuredly I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Jesus marveled, or it says Jesus was astonished or Jesus was amazed. Now it's hard for us to fathom exactly what it was that Jesus gave up in coming to earth. But as we talked about in Bible class this morning, he, he set himself aside, right? He set something of himself aside. He humbled himself. He emptied himself in coming to earth. And he's amazed because where should he have expected to find such great faith in people watching and waiting for the Messiah? Should have been in Israel. They had the law. They had the prophets. They had all the prophecies that talked about the Messiah who was going to come and, and what it was that he was going to do. But the problem that the Jews had is that they had blinders on and they couldn't see Jesus when he showed up. They had a preconceived notion about what the Messiah was going to be like. And they were expecting somebody to come riding in on a white horse and he's going to kick the Romans out and he's going to defeat all of Israel's enemies and he's going to set up an earthly kingdom. And that's the picture that they had in their mind. And well, Jesus just didn't fit that. And he rode into town. It wasn't on a white horse. He rode into town on a donkey right? Lowly coming into town, right? When he, when he comes into Jerusalem. And so he's not what they expected. And so they, they have this preconceived notion. And because of their preconceived notion, when Jesus shows up on the scene, they, they miss it. They don't recognize it. We can have that problem too. If we come to scripture with a lot of preconceived notions, all I need to do is have, believe. If I just believe, then I'll be saved. And we find a passage, we say, aha, there it is. Or all I need to do is confess Jesus. And if I confess Jesus, then I'm, I'm good to go. I'll be saved. Aha, there it is. We've got to make sure that when we come to Scripture, we don't have preconceived notions and we don't have our blinders on, but that we see what the Word of God actually says and then we base our conclusions off of what it is that we see. This centurion was able to see something in Jesus, reach the conclusion that he had power and authority to do what it is that he's asking, where the Jews, they were missing it because of their preconceived notion. And so Jesus marvels at this and says, you know, I've not found this great faith even where I expected to find it in Israel. And then Jesus goes on and he says, he says, I say to you, right? Now he's saying this to those who follow him. He's not saying this for the benefit of the centurion. He's saying this for the benefit of the Jews who are there with him who think just because they're Jews, they're going to be saved. He says, I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now, to the Jew, that'd be a mind-blowing statement. What? People are going to come from east and west? You mean those dirty Gentiles are going to sit down at the table in the kingdom of heaven with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? That, that wouldn't fathom for them. But, you know, that was part of God's plan all the, all the way back from the beginning. When he tells Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 that in your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. All the nations. Well, guess what? That word for nations is the same Hebrew word that's used for Gentiles. They're all going to be saved, right? They're all going to have that opportunity. But that would have blown their minds because they thought that, well, just because, you know, we're, we're born of the stock of Abraham and circumcised on the eighth day that we've punched our ticket to heaven. Well, Jesus says, no, that's not the case. There's going to be a lot of Gentiles that are going to be here. But for the sons of the kingdom, he says in verse 12, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The sons of the kingdom are those Jews who, like I said, they think they've got it made because they're Jews because they're, they're born of Abraham, right? And so they punched their ticket to heaven. And he says, no, those sons of the kingdom, those who refuse to accept Jesus, they're going to be cast out. And so even though they think, well, we're God's chosen people because we're Jews, because we're Hebrews, because we're Israelites, he says, no, that's not going to be the case. If, if they refuse Jesus and they don't see Jesus for who he is, well, then they're going to be cast out. 
in a place where there's outer darkness. Why is there darkness? God is the light. God's not going to be there. It's going to be a place of darkness. And he says there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, weeping we get. Gnashing of teeth isn't something that we use uh, every day in our common vernacular. Uh, but if you like watching old Western movies, sometimes I like watching the old Western movies, and they, they have the showdown, right? And the hero gets, gets shot in the arm, and so they bring him in, and they lay him on the table, and they take a piece of wood or a strap of leather, and they, they put it between his teeth, and they say, you better bear down on this, and you better gnash down on this, because we're going to dig the bullet out of your arm. We don't have any anesthetic, right? So it's going to hurt. And so that idea of gnashing of teeth is that there's going to be constant pain. There's going to be constant suffering. There's going to be constant weeping. God's not going to be there. There will be no hope. And this is a common way that Jesus uses in the Gospel of Matthew in describing what hell is going to be like. He mentions it here. He uses it again when he gets over to chapter 13. Uh, it comes up in chapters 22, 24, and 25, this idea of this outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, if we know what the Gospel says, and we know what Jesus has said, and we know what it is that we need to do in order to be saved, there's no reason for any of us to be in the outer darkness where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's not a place where we should want anyone uh, to go. <clears throat> and so he's, he marvels, right, that here's this centurion, this, this guy that he doesn't expect because he doesn't have the benefit of the law, he doesn't have the benefit of the prophets being a Roman soldier uh, to, to be able to, you know, see all the prophecies of the Messiah coming, and yet he recognizes him. And Jesus, in verse 13, said to the centurion, Go your way as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. And so in this particular miracle, we see that Jesus has power and authority over time and space. It doesn't matter that he's not in the same place where the centurion's servant is. He's able to heal him from wherever it is that he, he is at. The third miracle is just two verses. It's verses 14 and 15. It says, Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and served them. Jesus comes into Peter's house here. He's come down from the mountain. He's, he's had this interaction, and he gets to Peter's house, and he comes into the house, and the, and the text says that Peter has a mother-in-law. I find that interesting. I was raised Catholic, and you know, we've, we've got a large uh, denominational group that wants us to believe that Peter uh, was celibate, that he wasn't married, that he didn't have any children. Uh, but here the text says that Peter has a mother-in-law. I know very few men that would take on the burden of a mother-in-law and not get a wife in the deal. <laughs> I would have to think that Peter's married, right? <clears throat> and so he comes in and, and, you know, when someone's got a fever, and in Luke's account, he says, Luke being the physician, he gives us a little more information. He says that she has a high fever, right? And so when somebody has a fever, you might look at him, you might say, well, you, you, don't, you don't look like you feel well. You look like you might be under the weather, but we don't know exactly what's going on with them. Now, notice Jesus, he doesn't do any blood work. He doesn't run a CAT scan, right? He doesn't perform an MRI or anything like that. He just, he touches her hand and the fever leaves her. And so he touches her and delivers her from her fever, delivers her from what's ailing her. And in the text, it says, as soon as her fever leaves her, it says she arose and she served them. Some manuscripts say that she arose and she served him. I think that's a good example for us. She was delivered from her ailment, and she arose and served him. How do we respond when God touches us, spiritually speaking, in the waters of baptism? When we go down in the waters of baptism, we make contact with his blood, and Jesus, if you will, touches us, spiritually speaking, and cleanses us of our sin ailment that is going to cause us to die, right? The wages of sin is death. And he cleanses us from that, and he delivers us from that outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do we arise from the waters of baptism ready to serve him? Or do we think to ourselves, you know, maybe in five years uh, I'll, I'll know enough and, and I can maybe lead a prayer. Maybe in ten years I'll, I'll take a chance and, and get up and, and, uh, and lead a song. Uh, or maybe in 15 years I'll get up on a Wednesday night and deliver a devotional message. Do we arise ready to serve him? Fields are white unto harvest. Pray that the Lord of harvest will send forth laborers. We need laborers in the kingdom. And there's something that all of us can do. You might say, well, I'm a new Christian. I don't know very much yet, and that may be true. Maybe you're not ready to get up and deliver a sermon or something like that. But there's something that everybody can do. 
When, when I was a preaching student, we had left Ohio, we had left our friends behind, we sold our house, left jobs, came all the way across the country to Denver, Colorado. I would get cards from one of the widow ladies that was back there in Ohio. And boy, what an encouragement that was to me as a, as a preaching student to know that she was praying for me and she was thinking about me and, she, you know, and, and the things that we had given up uh, in order to do what we were going to do. We can be an encouragement to somebody and that doesn't take very much effort. There's something that all of us can do in the kingdom. She arose and served him and we should do the same. When she is uh, in this particular miracle, we see here that Jesus has got power. And then he's got authority not just over the external body, but also the internal body. He's got power and authority over the internal world in that he's able to heal Peter's mother-in-law. For the fourth miracle, we need to skip down to verse 23. In verse 23, it says, then, Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. His disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. So here they are. They're in the boat. They're on the Sea of Galilee. Let's kind of set the scene here. Uh, there's a great tempest that arises on the sea. This has got to be something uh, miraculous in order to show Jesus' power, because just think about who you've got in this boat amongst the, these apostles. Right? Amongst the 12 men, we know that at least four of them are professional fishermen. Right? There's Peter and his brother Andrew. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, John and his brother, the sons of Zebedee, right, who were fishermen. They were with their father. They were mending their nets when Jesus uh, called them into service. And so we know that they, they're professional fishermen. And they're Galileans. They've probably been on the Sea of Galilee hundreds of times, probably been involved in a, dozens of storms. But this one's got them scared. And so what do they do? They, they come to the carpenter, right? They come to the preacher. And they say, you know, the least you could do is get up and join us in some good old-fashioned hand-wringing here, right? Because the storm's going to kill all of us. Now, the Sea of Galilee is a relatively shallow body of water. And I grew up on the shores of Lake Erie, and it's a relatively shallow body of water. And when you get the right kind of wind that comes across that shallow body of water, you can pop up a storm pretty quick. You don't want to be out there when that happens. And so these guys, you know, while they're used to being on the sea and they're used to storms, this one's got them scared. It's a great tempest. And so they come to Jesus and they wake him up and they say, Jesus, save us. We're, we're going to perish uh, in, in this storm. And notice the contrast here where Jesus says, you of little faith. Now, these are the guys that have been around him, right? These are the guys who ought to know better, but they're still struggling to get this under their belt as far as who Jesus really is. Because he says, you've got little faith. A centurion had great faith, right? But these guys, they've got little faith. Notice also the contrast between the great tempest, and when Jesus rebukes the wind and the sea, you've got great calm. And what does Jesus do to still the storm? Basically, he yells at it, right? He rebukes the wind and the waves, and you've got great calm. Just imagine that working for a moment. Imagine that we're here in Pigeon Forge, and, and the weather service says that, you know, there's a tornado that's coming, and, and the direction it's coming from, and, and Brother Hayes and Brother Haynes, they go out in the parking lot, and they face the direction where it's coming from, and, and they yell, knock it off. Right? And everything gets calm. Just imagine having that power. Right? We, we can't do that. Right? The old adage is everyone complains about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Well, why is that? Because you can't do anything about it. Right? We've got a bunch of scientists who think they're going to change the weather. Good luck. We can't change the weather. Right? We can't do anything about it. But Jesus could. Jesus was able to still the storm just by rebuking the, the wind and the waves. And notice that when he does this, his disciples are amazed by this, right? And notice in verse 27, the men marveled and said, who can this be that even the winds and the waves obey him? You notice the question that's on their mind? Who is Jesus, right? Who is this guy that he's even able to control the winds and the waves? And in this miracle, we see that Jesus has power and authority over nature, He's got power and authority over nature. Now, Jesus doesn't answer the question, right? They say, well, who is this? That he, you know, Jesus doesn't say, well, hello. He doesn't give them the answer. They're going to get the answer. Matthew's going to give us the answer. He's going to give the readers his answer. But the, the answer comes from a most unlikely source here in the performance of the fifth miracle. Notice in verse 28, the fifth miracle begins. It says, when he had come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out saying, what have we do to do with you, 
Jesus, you son of God, have you come here to torment us before the time? Notice the demons. They see him coming. They recognize who he is. Who is Jesus? The demons say he's the son of God. They said, what have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? They recognize who he is. They know who he is. They recognize that he's got authority over them. And at some point, they're going to be tormented because of what it is that they've chosen to do. And so they recognize who he is. Now, we've got a lot of people running around today saying, well, I believe that there's a God, and I believe that Jesus Christ is his son, but it doesn't change anything in their life. They don't live their life any differently based on that. They don't read the scriptures. They won't darken the door of the church building. They think that they're fine because they believe in God and they believe that Jesus Christ exists. Well, notice these demons, these demons believe that God exists. Do these demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Are these demons going to be saved? You see, there's a big difference in believing that God is and believing in God. There's a difference in believing that Jesus is the Son of God and believing in what Jesus has to say in order to be obedient. These demons are not obedient. They're not willing to submit to him. And so they're not going to be saved even though they know that there's one God and that Jesus is his son. So just knowing that isn't enough. It's got to cause some difference in our life. It's got to cause some obedience to the things that he has said. Because we see here that Jesus, right, he's not just a man. Because men can't do the things that Jesus does. And so these demons recognize him. Notice something else they say. They say, what have we to do with you? Oh, I wish more people understood what these demons understand. Darkness and light don't go together. Christianity and worldliness don't go together, right? These demons say, what have we to do with you? We don't have fellowship with darkness, right? Now we want, we're in the world, we have to be in the world, we have to be about the people that are in the world in order to lead them to Christ, but we can't have one foot in the Lord's kingdom and one foot in the world and think that somehow that's gonna work out okay. The demons even understand that we don't have fellowship with one another, you know, what are we to do with you? And so they understand that he's, he's going to do something with them. It says, now a good way off from them in verse 30, there was a herd of many swine feeding. I don't know what the swine are doing in Palestine. Jews weren't allowed to have them. They weren't on the diet plan that Moses had given them, right? Uh, but, you know, maybe they're raising them for the Gentiles or more than likely they're not following the dietary restrictions here. But there's a herd of swine that are feeding. So the demons begged him saying, if you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. The demons don't want to be bodiless. They, they say if, but it's, it's a... I think first class conditional here where it's not really an if, it's a since. The original language has the idea that since you're not going to allow us to remain in these two guys, since you are going to cast us out, we don't want to be bodiless in dry places. You know, let us go into this, this herd of swine. And so they beg Jesus and ask him uh, to do that. And he says to them, go. Doesn't wave his hands around. Doesn't have any great grandiose words. Just go. And the power of his voice was able to command those demons so that when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. I don't know what that's all about. Um, but maybe God's taking care, maybe Jesus was taking care of their swine problem, right? And so he's killing two birds with one stone. But he's, he's able to cast these demons out and it shows that Jesus has power and authority over the spiritual realm. Now, in these five particular miracles, when we look at these, we see that Jesus has power and authority over the external world and the healing of the leper. We see that he's got power and authority over time and space and healing the centurion's servant. We see that he's got power and authority over the inner world and healing Peter's mother-in-law. We see that he's got power and authority over nature and the stilling of the storm. And he's got power and authority over the spiritual realm when he casts out these demons. I ask you, what's left? What's left that Jesus doesn't have power and authority over? I don't think it's any mistake that this, these five specific miracles are recorded for us here in Matthew chapter 8. Because what has Jesus just finished? He's just finished the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Greatest sermon ever delivered or that we have recorded for us. And as he gets to the end of that sermon, notice with me in chapter 7, in verse 28, it says, And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Jesus taught them as one having authority and then he showed them that he's got authority and he's got authority over everything. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, we're told the purpose of miracles 
is to confirm the word. And these miracles of Jesus confirm to us the words that he spoke, confirm to us that he is who he said he is. C.S. Lewis once said that there's only one of three categories that you can put Jesus in. He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's the Lord. Either Jesus came to earth and, and knew full well that he wasn't deity and that he wasn't the Son of God, and yet claimed to be, in which case he's a liar. And guess what? If he's a liar, he's not a good man. Or he's a lunatic. He came to earth and he really believed that he was the Son of God and he really believed that he was deity, uh, but he was mistaken like, like guys that are, you know, maybe think that they're Napoleon. And if that's the case, he's a lunatic and he's not a good man. Or else he was who he said he was. And he's the Lord. And because he's able to do things that men cannot do, when people say, well, I love Jesus, Jesus was a good man, we ought to say, you're selling them short. Jesus is so much more than just a good man because men can't do what Jesus can do. And because of that, we need to pay attention to what it is that he said. We talked about it in Hebrews uh, this morning in the Bible class period in Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken by angels proved to be steadfast and every disobedience uh, received a just reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first was spoken to us by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. We need to pay attention to what it is that Jesus has said. Jesus has said what it is we need to do in order to be saved. He says, we've got to believe in him. In John chapter 8 and verse 24, he says, unless you believe that I am, that I'll take you back to the burning bush, right? Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. We've got to believe in who Jesus is. We've got to believe in what it is that he says and be willing to obey what he says to do. He says in Luke chapter 13, verse 3, and he repeats it in verse 5, I tell you no, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We've got to change when we find that there are things that we're doing that aren't in accordance with what Jesus has said and not in accordance with God's word. We've got to make a change in our lives. We've got to straighten that out. We have to be willing to confess him before men. In Matthew chapter 10, in verse 32, Jesus says, If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. That's a deal. You're not going to find a better deal this side of heaven, and we ought to take that quick, fast, and in a hurry. And he says in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. We've got to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. That's what Jesus says. And we need to obey what Jesus says. Maybe you're here today and you've not done that. Maybe you haven't put the Lord on in baptism yet. You've got the opportunity to do that before you leave here. Maybe you've been baptized, but you've been not, not been walking the path uh, that Jesus has mapped out for us. You've wandered away from what Jesus wants us to be and where Jesus wants us to, to go and what Jesus wants us to do. You've got an opportunity to fix that too by coming forward and we'll pray with you. If you've got a need, there's, there's no reason to walk out of these doors today and not be in a right relationship with Jesus. If there's any way that we can help you, let your need be known by coming forward now as we stand with our brethren as we sing. I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He paid that debt at Calvary. He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glory to see him on that day? I then will sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. 
Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you so much, Dale. Beautiful lesson. <clears throat> I want to remember Jesus in a beautiful, in intimate way as we gather around the table with each other, thinking about all that he has done for us, the Lamb of God. <clears throat> Let's sing this song before we uh, meet around the Lord's table together. <clears throat> Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. O oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. We'd like to take this time to show forth our Savior's death till he comes again. So we will surround the table here and uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. If you would, uh, we'll take partake of the bread. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day that you've blessed us with. We thank you so much, Father, for the this bread which represents the body of your Son and our Savior that was died on that cross for our sins. Father, we pray that as we take this emblem that we do so in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. pray again for them. Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine which represents the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for our sins. Father, we pray as we partake of this emblem that our minds and hearts goes back to that scene where he hung and died for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 